about the United States as a as a scene in which and about one which one writes fiction is it damn it you just have to, to to try it seems to me to get a big enough cut of it uh, to get the the um, minimum sense of diversity and variety that's that's a big challenge it's it's still a big challenge and you know there's there's so many excuses offered for not trying to grapple with it. You know, it, uh, you see upon something like the novel of manners, as though we could have a European novel of manners in this country. I don't, I don't think it's possible. I don't, further, I don't even think it's desirable. You know, you, 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 um, you can d take advantage of all of the, the theories, all of the insights of, of anybody, from Burke through Empson to Sir James Frazier, but you still got this crazy, highly mobile country with every damn thing happening, and about the only people who are who are uh, not trying to deal with it seem to be novelists. I mean, you, th this is unfair uh, in a way, but not not so very unfair. I would would. Um, you know, as a kid, listen to the Pullman porters. When they started telling what was happening up the line, um, you knew that, that uh, you were the same people uh, living in Oklahoma City as against those who were living in St. Joe, Missouri, or Chicago, or Kansas City. Uh, and you, but you also knew that things were a little bit different in Kansas City, Kansas, as against Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And there they were, twin cities, so to speak. But they were always reporting the variety and always uh, uh, giving you a report on the manners. But, uh, God, you, you could pick up novel after novel after novel now, and you, don't, you, you, you get a sense that uh, there's no United States out there. Which, which is one, one of the things that, that uh, one of the critics used to say to me in, in conversation. He said, oh, Ralph, did you, you know, you really believe that there's a, a United States out there. There's no United States. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, testing. Allison, how do you feel about being interviewed? Well, naturally, you you feel uh, quite mixed about it. That uh, you and you feel the fascination. I'm fascinated by how uh, the interviewer's mind works. I'm uh, and I'm also aware that uh, for all my uh, shunning of a public role which uh, is divorced from my identity as a writer, any kind of uh, statement that I make, any time my face appears, uh, there are a lot of people who are going to be uh, interpreting uh, my face, my statements in terms of my racial identity rather than in terms of the quality of what I have to say. Uh, power uh, for the writer, uh, it seems to me, lies in his ability to reveal uh, uh, a just if only a little bit more about the complexity of of, uh, of humanity, and in this country, I think it's very very important for uh, the writer to, no matter what the agony of his experience, uh, uh, he should stick to what he's doing because the slightest thing that it's new or the slightest thing which has been overlooked, uh, uh, which would tell us about the, the, the unity of American experience beyond all considerations of class, or of, of race, or religion, are uh, very, very important. Uh, I think that the nation is still in a process of becoming, of, of, of drawing itself together, of discovering itself. And when the writer fails to contribute to this, 
then he's he's played his his uh, art false, and I think that uh, he probably also does violence to our political vision of ourselves because usually when a writer becomes a political spokesman he speaks out of context he doesn't have the the discipline uh, forces uh, behind him he leads nobody really uh, there's no one to say no to him he floats on a sea of publicity and uh, uh, on the uh, uh, easy availability of uh, the big media so to speak in the fall of 1965 the new york herald tribune asked 200 authors to name the best American works of fiction since the war. The book most often cited was Invisible Man. The result of seven years' work, this first novel won for its author the National Book Award in 1953. Ralph Ellison has also written numerous short stories and essays. A recent selection of his nonfiction is entitled Shadow and Act. Ralph Ellison was born in Oklahoma City and was named for Ralph Waldo Emerson. A music major and varsity athlete in college, he only decided he was a writer in his mid-twenties. He had first tried musical composition, then sculpture. Since that decision, he has also worked as a professional photographer, an electronics specialist, and as a teacher of literature. Mr. Ellison, do you enjoy your teaching? I feel this about teaching that they're one of the few places where I can be in uh, touch with the younger generation, so, so to speak, uh, is a, in a classroom, especially uh, teaching uh, literature and advising young writers. Because then I know how they formulate their questions or how they misunderstand their problems. Uh, I, I keep in touch with... with um, the, their latest slang, I, um, I am able to discover how they regard their values, uh, their styles, and so on. But the, the uh, thing that I object to about teaching is that I go into a classroom uh, and I remember that I had some faulty teaching myself and I try to be responsible. And after a certain uh, period, say a year, uh, I find that uh, much of my energy goes into teaching it, it, it itself, and at that point I want to withdraw. Here in his Manhattan apartment, 150th Street and Riverside Drive, where he lives with his wife, Fanny McConnell, Mr. Ellison, at 51, took time out from the last stages of work on his new novel to grant one of his rare interviews and also to read a passage from his complex work in progress. He frequently employs the tape recorder to test the rhythm of his writing and get back into it. Mr. Ellison, would you describe the, the genesis of your first novel? I came to write Invisible Man as a result of a, of a failure. I had conceived of a novel during the time I was going to see. I was, during the Second World War, I was working as a second cook and baker on merchant ships. But somehow, um, the Rosenwald Fund had granted me a uh, fellowship to work on a novel, and I had a novel. It was a wartime novel, uh, uh, wherein uh, I had a um, Negro flyer. We were very excited by the fact that Negroes were flying planes during that war, but also concerned that um, they weren't being allowed uh, into combat as rapidly as some of us thought so. But anyway, I conceived of this book wherein a Negro flyer comes down, is captured by the Nazis, and is uh, placed in a uh, detention camp where he is the highest ranking officer. Uh, you can see how uh, <laughs> how my mind was working. Uh, he was a highest ranking American and you had the Nazi who uh, was philosophically minded and uh, who uh, pitted this American against the other Americans. Well, going into La Havre uh, on that particular trip to see when I was working on this book, 
uh, it turned out to be such a hot passage that um, I came back uh, to the States with a blood pressure of about 90 and, and absolutely uh, through with that particular idea. The emotional organization and everything was just, just uh, out of it. But uh, one thing led to another. I was somewhat ill and the Merchant Marine Hospital people told me to get a rest. And I went to a friend's place at uh, Waitsfield, Vermont. And while there, uh, certain things that I'd been doing, reading, thinking about, came into focus. It's sort of unconscious focus, as, as often happens when you're writing something. I had been reading Lord Raglan's uh, The Hero and thinking about the, the question of the mythological leader and how historical figures take on his, uh, myth, uh, mythic uh, attributes as they become prominent. And I was thinking about uh, the uh, fact that Negro leaders uh, at that time uh, seldom really led Negroes, but were uh, uh, usually dependent upon the largesse of, of white supporters, that they had no uh, particular way in affecting their will. And I was, of course, concerned with literary problems and uh, with a number of other intellectual things, which I can't go into now, but while um, there, one morning, scribbling, I wrote uh, the first sentence of, of uh, what later became Invisible Man. I'm an Invisible Man. And I played with that, started to reject it, but it intrigued me, and I began to put other things with it. And uh, uh, pretty soon, I had uh, a novel going. I began to, to work out a conceptual outline of it, and uh, as fast as I could work out the concepts, the, the incidents started flowing in on me. Um, I knew that, that I could write an incident and develop it, but the problem of making holes and the, and the problem of, of taking uh, incidents from real life and converting them into fiction, uh, uh, more, uh, to, that is, snatching them out of the, the realm of the known and out of the continuity of day-to-day of, uh, -day fact, uh, uh, made for a sort of, uh, of, of anxiety on my part even though at the same time I knew that I was giving them another meaning, but I'd never quite written that way before. So that, that the problem of continuity uh, was ultimately one of, uh, uh, of self-confidence on my part, a lack of self-confidence, a, a failure to, to uh, be arrogant enough, even though uh, the way I was putting the thing together was, <laughs> was perhaps one of the most arrogant acts of, that, that I've uh, ever commissioned. This is an Indian Buddha, the head of Buddha. It's a, Vendi a red sandstone, and it's from the Jain period. And uh, I uh, came into this, uh, uh, came to possess this uh, through a very interesting way. I was looking in the window of uh, the uh, art gallery of William Wolfe on Madison Avenue there, and there. Um, uh, 70th Street, 69th Street, and he was trying to get a spotlight on it. And I was standing there, so I began to help him sp uh, place a spot. And afterwards, he invited me to come in, and I went in, and he showed me all of the wonderful things that he had. And then somewhat later, about six months later, after having dreamed about this thing a few times, I went in to see it, and it wasn't there. And I asked him, where was it? He said, oh, it's downstairs. And would you like to see it? Yes, I wanted to see it. He brought it up. And then he said, y you like th uh, that, don't you? I said, yes. He said, well, why don't you buy it? Uh, I said, well, I couldn't possibly afford it. And uh, he said, well, we'll work it out. Should you pay me so much and uh, pay me so much a month? So I came home with this piece. <laughs> and uh, it's given me a great deal of pleasure. This, by the way, uh, uh, is, is odd enough um, all of the art uh, here is tied up 
in a strange way with my career as a writer. When I first came to, to New York, the first two novels I, that I read were by Andre Malraux, Man's Faith and Days of Wrath. And uh, I began looking for things uh, published by Malraux and began to find uh, uh, copies of the American version of Verve magazine, which is no longer published in English. But in those magazines, Malraux was publishing um, uh, essays which later appeared in his Museum Without Walls. And uh, uh, it was in these early essays that I began to develop an interest because I could see the relationship between art as manifested in, in the plastic arts and painting and sculpture uh, uh, and between the, uh, the philosophical ideas and the religious rituals and so on uh, out of which art grew. It's one which has uh, uh, done quite a lot to uh, free me from any uh, narrow-minded concept of what art is about. Do you sense a continuity in your work from the novel to your book of essays and on through the work in progress? Well, uh, when I put the essays together, uh, I was surprised at the, at the close continuity which uh, was revealed there. Uh, however, I was not quite so surprised by that as I was um, um, by the, the um, sort of emotional and symbolic continuity that I found in Invisible Man at a certain point just before I realized that I had to, 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 uh, to complete it. And this came about through, through a shock. Uh, at Tuskegee, as a student, I... I uh, when I was trying to be a composer, I used to meet uh, in the piano practice rooms a man who had had some experience uh, in professional jazz orchestras and who was an orchestrator, a very fine one, and who had come back to, to do some studying. And we uh, used to meet there in, in the morning before classes he trying to, he uh, arranging and me trying to work out my uh, harmonic exercises or whatever little arrangements that I was putting together. And we often talked and I learned things from him and, and uh, liked him very much. Well, um, during the time that I was writing Invisible Man, I was walking the dogs uh, just about the dusk um, on St. Nicholas Avenue, about 153rd Street. We were living down at uh, uh, two blocks below there, uh, three blocks below, and I, I was so pleased to see this fellow that I walked up and uh, uh, suddenly I was plunged back uh, to, uh, into college days, and uh, suddenly I realized that we were not communicating and I looked at the fellow and I uh, realized that uh, he was insane. I had gone through a stage of insanity uh, and uh, had been in an institution. And he had given up music. He was one of the finest uh, uh, jazz musicians. And uh, uh, he, well, he talked in a rambling way and his face had a certain bloated, uh, uh, aspect which one sees very often in people who are slightly deranged are deranged. And after uh, an interval, he went on his way and I went back. Well, the next morning, uh, shaving, I looked at myself in the mirror and I had <laughs> that uh, uh, slightly puffy uh, uh, look. And I said, well, you've got, you've got to finish this damn book. And uh, uh, I went on, and, and I finished it. Then uh, going through it, and especially going through it after the, the critics had been going through it, I, I realized that there was something rather frightening to have your emotional life and your, your psychic life, as well as your conscious life, uh, uh, concerned with a given group of, of problems over a period of five to seven years. Uh, uh, something a little appalling about that, but uh, uh, when I backed off of it, I realized that, that this would have to be so, that 
uh, the, the, a given work of art, if it's really working, should engage all of the important centers of one's being. And uh, uh, if you work slow, uh, the more intricate that's apt to be, even though you, you, you throw out a great deal of it as you uh, come to the completion of that particular, uh, that particular uh, work of art, if it turns out to be a work of art. They cut out our tongues. They left us speechless. They cut out our tongues. Lord, they left us without words. Amen. They scattered our tongues in this land like seed, and they left us without language. They took away our talking drums. Drums that talk, Daddy Hickman? Tell us about those talking drums. Drums that talked like a telegraph. Drums that could reach across the country like a church bell sound. Drums that told the news almost before it happened, Reverend Bliss. Drums that spoke with big voices like big men. Drums like a conscience and a deep heartbeat that knew right from wrong. Drums that told glad tidings. Drums that sent the news of trouble speeding home. Drums that told us our time and told us where we were. Those were some drums, Reverend Hickman. Yes, and they took those drums away. Away, away, and they took away our heathen dances. They left us drumless and they left us danceless. Ah, yes, Reverend Bliss, they burnt up our talking drums and our dancing drums. Drums, and they scattered their ashes. Ah, eyeless, tongueless, drumless, danceless, ashes. And a worse devastation was yet to come. Lord God, tell us, Reverend Hickman, blow on your righteous horn. Ah, but Reverend Bliss, in those days we didn't have any horns. No horns? Hear him, brothers and sisters. And we had no songs, no songs. And we had no, count it on your fingers. See what cruel man has done. Amen, Reverend Bliss, you lead them. We were eyeless, tongueless, drumless, danceless, hornless, songless. All true, Reverend Bliss. No eyes to see. No tongue to speak or taste. No drums to raise the spirits and warm our memories. No dance to stir the rhythm that makes life move. No songs to give praise and prayers to God. We were truly in the dark, my young brothers and sisters. Eyeless, earless, tongueless, drumless, danceless, songless, hornless, soundless, and worse to come, and worse to come. Tell us, Reverend Hickman, but not too fast, so that we of the younger generation can gather up our strength to face it, so that we may listen and not become discouraged, so that we continue and not be weary. say literary traditions, although it's really a tradition of eloquence, which I bring to fiction from my Negro background, is, is the, uh, uh, the eloquence which you find within the Negro church, uh, wherein the, the uh, minister who might preach uh, variations on the same sermon uh, a hundred times a year or more, uh, uh, but who uh, must at the same time believe that as he is, he's initiated, he is a manipulator of, of emotions and of eloquence and, uh, and of, sa uh, of sacred vision, so to speak. And uh, uh, so as to keep himself, to keep his own uh, values alive, to keep his own faith and his own belief uh, alive, uh, he concentrates on the technique of arousing uh, uh, these visions, arousing, uh, making the word and, uh, and caps uh, manifest. And uh, uh, it's one of those ironies where in you find that you have been 
uh, prepared uh, to uh, approach your given art form at a time when you weren't even concerned with any kind of art, except maybe that of shooting marbles. Um, not that I got it solely from, from Negro churches or listening to uh, Negro orators, but uh, it gelled with, for instance, uh, the long uh, sermons and Joyce uh, in, in um, uh, the portrait of the artist as young man. And uh, so I was feeding uh, that Negro church uh, experience into Joyce. And uh, I was also uh, uh, learning to see that this kind of eloquence uh, was a very valuable thing for a writer of fiction. Um, not only because it's something, uh, it has possibilities of uh, presenting something new and fresh for readers who are not Negro, who don't share that particular experience, but because uh, it has its own rhetorical shade it has uh, its own uh, uh, stable, well, not stable, but its own um, uh, cluster of imagery. It has uh, uh, imagery which gets uh, uh, into folklore, and it gets into uh, uh, the blues. It gets into uh, folk song, and it gets into popular songs written by Negroes. So you, you, you do something quite rich, and uh, I think it's one of the... The, the very valuable uh, uh, traditions for uh, American writers. And incidentally, you notice that I say American writers, not Negro American writers. It's, this is part of, uh, uh, of the general American literary heritage. Uh, heritage. How near to completion is your work in progress? Well, if I knew exactly, I think I'd rest a little freer in my own mind. Well, I can tell you this, that the first book of the novel is now being typed, and as soon as that's done, I'll start working with my editor on it. Um, he hasn't seen uh, the work in progress but once. I work uh, out of a conceptual outline so that I'm able to work in great blocks, but I try to keep it fluid by not uh, uh, keeping to uh, a direct line of continuity. Uh, I tell myself that allows the imagination to be free and to uh, give reality to the concepts in ways which I don't always expect. But uh, it's about as much as I can say about it. I want to publish the book uh, in the coming year, so the pressure's on. National Educational Television Network.